Good morning. It's 8.30 on Monday, February 28th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, we talk black history with a black history maker, attorney Constance Slaughter Harvey. Then a rally in Brookhaven over an alleged unprovoked shooting involving a black FedEx driver. And a bill to expand postpartum Medicaid coverage faces an uncertain future in a statehouse committee. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On this final day of Black History Month, we're joined by one of Mississippi's great black history makers, Constance Slaughter Harvey became in 1970 the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Mississippi School of Law. She's gone on to work as a lawyer, a judge, and as a key piece of Governor William Winter's cabinet. She's now president and CEO of the Legacy Education and Community Empowerment Foundation, which is a nonprofit that focuses on education access for underserved communities. She tells much of her life story Her life's work has been informed by her experiences growing up in the Jim Crow era, Mississippi. I've been told to uh, go to the back window, and I refused uh, because I was not that hungry. Uh, I've been asked to uh, go to the other side in order to see a dentist, and I refused. I mean, Jim Crow was was a part of, of my life growing up. My father would never let us go to the movies because he would not permit us to sit in the balcony, nor would he permit us to uh, ride the bus. But I rode the bus once during the Jim Crow days when I was at Tougaloo and uh, did not sit at the back of the bus, and there were no problems. So, uh, yes, Jim Crow is a part of of who we are, and I, I believe that experiencing the Jim Crow tragedies and injustices created that desire and need to change Mississippi. How old are you now? I am 75 years old, born June 18, 1946, and I never thought I'd ever live past 40. Why? Because I was moving so fast and, and, and just going all over the place trying to address every problem that I encountered. And I remember my father told me, he said, every battle is not a war. And I think of that now, that was the best advice, but I still consider every battle to be uh, essential to bringing about a change. So you were on a crusade. You joined the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law as a staff attorney and worked there. Right. Until 1972. Until 1970, really, it was 73. Okay. He lost the Jackson State case, and I knew that was one of the best prepared cases in the whole world. And many people cite that case as one of the best prepared cases. Uh, We had a New York law firm, Cravath, Swain, and Moore, that helped with that case. After we lost that case, I lost faith in the system, especially when it came to civil rights cases. And I could not go back to that because I was physically and mentally and spiritually affected by that. And the judge, the the, the lawyers on the other side, in fact, some of the lawyers who went outside, um, the jurors, uh, the yelling, the rebel flag uh, flowing, and the the yahoo, who in the victory when the verdict was was announced, it was a a little too much for me. And I did not want to be a part of the problem. Now, that case was where the two... African American males were shot on the Jackson State University campus. That's correct. It was James Earl Green, who was a high school student, seventeen year old Jim Hill Senior. Uh he was running he was coming home from having worked all day, uh, to share his check with his mother. And then there was Philip Gibbs who was a junior and he was walking his sister uh back to the dormitory, um, Alexander Hall and, and they were murdered. By law enforcement. By, poli- by, by law enforcement. And um, the the ordeal that I went through in order to get evidence of how Jackson State, uh, the administration of Jackson State was so cruel to me, but they were not cruel to to white lawyers. Uh, it, it was just, it was too much, too much. And that's why I very seldom like to relive it. 
why did you decide to go into your own practice? Because I realized that people in Forest needed a good lawyer. And I also realized that civil rights was something that anybody would do because of so-called the glamour. And white lawyers were coming down from the north to help us, but nobody was really coming in helping the people who really needed help, day-to-day survival, like paying a light bill, you know, a mortgage, uh, credit, and all of that. So I came to Forest, and when I opened my practice, I also opened a program called Southern Legal Rights Association, and that's where we help people to help themselves. And I trained uh, uh, older uh, community activists, uh, Winston Hudson, Anna Devine, uh, Ruben, uh, Mr. Ruben, Nathan Ruben down in Simpson County. I trained them how to go back into their communities and help. And it was called a lay advocacy program, which was prior to the paralegal program. And I did that and I practiced law. And once I realized that they, they had fully understood their roles, then I worked with Michael Raff and others, and we established East Mississippi Legal Services, where the same clients that I served who couldn't afford to pay me could get quality legal services without having to pay. And once I got that established, then uh, Governor Winter asked me to join his staff. And it became obvious to me that the legal system was not doing what it was supposed to do, and perhaps the political system would be of assistance. So I stayed in, in state government for 16 years, and I realized that that was, not, that was really not the answer. So I came back and said, okay, let me do another approach. And I practiced law, and then I helped people help themselves with the program that we have now called Legacy. With all of your work, you stayed so busy, you probably didn't take time to exhale with everything that you were doing, you were constantly on the move, it seems. You're right. You're right. And the pandemic slowed me down. It made me stop and realize my daughter has been asking me to write a book at least 30 years. And I've always told her I don't have time. i got to keep moving to continue to try to bring about change. And the, during the pandemic, I realized that You do have time because you don't have anything else to do. You can't go out and speak. You can't do this. You're tired of Zoom and all of that. And so I just started writing some things. I, You know, maybe I have maybe 25 or 30 pages, but that's more than I had before. Because when I write, it brings back memories that are not pleasant. And I try not to be around things that are toxic. And some of my memories, when I put them on paper, they're toxic. And I, 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 I you know, I'd, I'd rather sometimes just close the book, do something else, work with the kids, you know, talk to the parents, uh, and then come back. Do you feel like you've made headway with the legacy organization? Oh, yes. My Lord, yes, 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 yes. We have instilled in young children the 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 pride that we once experienced when we were going to segregated schools, we were told that we were somebody. And we were told that regardless of the obstacles, if you prepare yourself, you can succeed. There was interest in each one of us individually by our teachers. I don't see that in the public schools today. Yet with legacy, we work with our kids. We listen to them. We hear them, we encourage them, and we smile. We smile. We started out small. We started out in Forest, moved to Morton, then Scott County. Now we're into Newton with the kids in Newton. We're up in Lee County. We are down in Jasper County. And today I just came back from Smith County down in Raleigh where the first African-American and the first female was sworn in as mayor of Raleigh, Mississippi, in Smith County. And that's unusual. 
So that is what empowerment is about, to help people, to help themselves, so that as they empower themselves, their families are empowered, and as their families are empowered, the communities are empowered. And that's the kind of change that you can't break with politics. And these kids get that. You know, we let them know the possibilities. You can do anything you want to, but you've got to listen. You've got to learn. You've got to learn how to write cursive writing. You can't sign a check with an X. If you do, it's not legal. But you must learn how to write your name. And these are not just black kids. These are Hispanic kids. These are biracial kids. These are white kids. We're across the board. So, yeah, I really feel that, that, that uh, we're making a difference. Most definitely. In terms of mentoring, educating, tutoring. Yes, yes. Right. And we put out, a, we have a newsletter. My daughter has a newsletter called The Legend. We share achievements of young children uh, that would otherwise not be known. Uh, we have an African American historical society where we go out and take interviews with children, do interviews of African Americans who have made contributions. Um, right now we have more than 70. So we're making a difference, uh, and we are being heard. We have a parents club where parents come in. We taught Robert Rees of Order. We simplified it. They now feel comfortable going to board meetings and participating. Uh, we have parent rights programs where we teach parents what their responsibilities are first and then what their rights are. Uh, you know, we, we do that. We go into the nursing homes prior to, to covid and we talk with the, the residents. We used to have our children to go into the residence uh, and sing Christmas songs or Christmas carols to them. They look forward to it. We enjoyed it. I mean, it's, it's um, to me, it's what I've always wanted to do, but now it's not just me. It's the board of directors, my daughter, my son-in-law, and my grandson. And it makes me happy. Constance Slaughter Harvey, thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts, your experiences, and your perspective. There definitely is a book there, <laughs> so don't <laughs> stop writing. <laughs> oh, There's okay, well, plenty to be said. I've heard, I've heard this so many times. And look, I appreciate so very much talking to you. You always make me feel encouraged. And I, I just appreciate so very much hearing your voice and, and, and talking with you. I appreciate it so much. Coming up, a look inside yesterday's racial justice rally in Brookhaven. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Racial justice advocates rallied in Brookhaven yesterday in response to a shooting incident that occurred last month. In, Jerry, in January, DeMontario Gibson, a black man, was delivering packages for FedEx when two white men allegedly began chasing him and shooting at him. Gibson escaped unharmed. The two white men were arrested on February 1st. Now Gibson's lawyers say the alleged attack should be investigated as a potential hate crime. And they say they're using peaceful protests to apply. I lost my place. Pressure to the legal system. Brittany Brown with the Gulf States Newsroom has our story. So the rally took place at St. James Missionary Baptist Church in Brookhaven. And it lasted from 4 p.m. till 6 p.m. yesterday. And the sanctuary was filled with Black people from across the Brookhaven community uh, showing support for DeMontario as he and his family and his lawyers pushed for a more thorough investigation of this incident. The local NAACP was there, and so were members of the New Black Panther Party, Black Lives Matter, and church leaders from across Brookhaven. The community seems to really be coming together, galvanized in their support for DeMontario. And DeMontario and his family, how do they say they're adjusting to all of this? I had the opportunity to talk to DeMontario and his mother, father, and grandmother. 
the Ontario says this incident, although it happened January 24th, is still taking a toll on him mentally. Andy says it's been hard for him to work and socialize with people because of the anxiety he's been experiencing since the shooting. Every day is like a struggle just to, you know, maintain. Like this morning I had a real bad anxiety attack. I was just by myself and I just felt like I wanted to explode, you know. I even cried a little bit, you know. I try to hold those emotions in, but it's just, it's getting, it seems like it's getting harder and harder. Dee Montario's grandmother, Jacqueline Kelker, says that she's shocked that her grandson is still dealing with the same issues that black people faced decades ago. It's like an unending cycle, and it's, it's time for a change. It's not just been, you know, time for it now. It's been time for a change. Our black people shouldn't have to go through this. No people should have to go through this. What does the community say they want to see happen next? So the Lincoln County NAACP are calling for the Brookhaven mayor and police chief to resign. Both have refused to do so. The NAACP says it will continue to organize and to take next steps. Dee Monterio's lawyers say they're pushing for a federal hate crime investigation of this incident and are urging local law enforcement to pursue more serious charges against the shooters like attempted murder. Activists at the rally say they're going to continue to organize events in Brookhaven to keep the energy going around this situation. All right, Brittany Brown of the Gulf States Newsroom, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a bill to expand postpartum Medicaid coverage faces an uncertain future in a state house committee. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. A bill to guarantee up to 12 months of postpartum Medicaid coverage for eligible mothers is parked in the Medicaid State House Committee. If it doesn't make it out by tomorrow's committee deadline, it'll be dead. Advocates for the legislation say it would improve health outcomes for mothers and infants in the state. Nikitra Burse is owner of a public health research firm called Six Dimensions. Senate Bill 2033, which was introduced by Senator Blackwell, uh, the chair of the Senate committee, Medicaid committee. And um, this bill would definitely support mothers. Um, it, it would support mothers all over the state. Our current data for the Mississippi Maternal Mortality Review Committee says that 30 percent of mothers um, who die, die after that six-week postpartum period. And so that's when they would drop off of Medicaid. And so that further just drives the gap in health care access. And and we know that extending that postpartum care to 12 months would provide care for mothers who do not have access. So it's really critical that we are able to, you know, get this passed. Has that bill gone before the full Senate? It went from the Senate to the House. Okay, so um, it went out of the Senate Medicaid Committee. And it's mm-hmm. over on the House side mm-hmm. in the Medicaid committee on that side. But you don't know if it's going to come out by that March 1st deadline. What would you Correct. say to urge the committee to move forward on this bill? I know that there have been bills in the past to extend Medicaid coverage for women after giving birth. Yeah, and I think it's, it's critical now. The national numbers are going up. Our state numbers are going up. And people are still dying and access to health insurance and during that postpartum period is critical. Any national medical association, any association will tell you that this is critical during that time period for mothers. And so if we want to try to address this issue, one way we can do that, an easy way we can do that is increase access and increase access for that 12 month period. And the maternal mort- most people will say, will think that when a mother dies, it's during that childbirth period, like, you know, during labor and delivery. For Mississippi, I think it's about 86% of those deaths are after a mother gives birth, but then that 37% is after that six-week period when they will fall off of Medicaid. And so if I don't have health insurance, I'm not going to a doctor. I'm trying to take care of myself at home. And so families just do not have access, and we deserve for our families to be able to have access to health insurance so that they can get their needs met and be around to take care of their children. 
This is an issue that I know affects low-income families, low-income moms. Is there a will, real willingness to make this happen? Because in many instances, we know that low-income families struggle to be heard and, and receive needed services depending on access, health insurance, et cetera. Well, I can't say if there is will, but there should be. Um, this is not a, to me, it's not a political issue. It's, it's about human and human rights, um, the ability to make health-related decisions that will give you the long lifespan that you deserve and access to health insurance should be a part of that. It's not that, you know, it shouldn't be dependent on how much money you make. You should be able to access quality health insurance um, so that you can make the right decisions for your family and yourself. Nikita Burst, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us. And thank we'll you. see what happens with this bill, March 1st. Thank you, Desiree. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Deep South Dining. Then at 10, it's Now You're Talking with Marshall Ramsey. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. See you tomorrow morning at 830 for the next Mississippi Edition only on MPB Think Radio. Enjoy the sunshine.